and welcome to um, this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. You know, for the first, for the next half hour, we're going to really have a discussion about the U.S. economy, from banking to health care concerns, looming um, recession, and the volatile stock market. And what we decided to do today is invite very successful entrepreneurs to join us today, entrepreneurs that have built multi-million dollar businesses. There seems to be a mindset in this country today that if you're wealthy, um, people cringe. But what we forget about the business class is they take the risk. They create jobs, security, health care. They take care of their employees, and we should celebrate their genius instead of envy it. So let me welcome Evan Charles, who's the founding and managing principal of Frontier Development and Hospitality, and also joining us again, Gavin Serial, who's the founder of uh, uh, Crypto, and we welcome them both back to the broadcast. L let, me, let, me, let me start with you, um, Gavin, on, on, on my Zoom. You know, there's always this economic pessimism that exists with inflation, Gary. Why is that? And how do you, how do you get people not to become pessimistic uh, about their daily routine as we keep having these different mixes about inflation? We just heard recently the GOP presidential candidates all agree that the Fed chair would be fired if they were if they if they became president of the United States. That sends a very uh, interesting message to the consumer. How do we balance the pessimism with the reality of this economy? Because no matter how many dips it may have taken, it still in perception seems to be very strong. Yeah, I mean the the. I don't want to say anything bad in terms of what the Fed is doing. I think they're just using the tools that they have to use. And while, you know, people may sit there and and uh, just really talk down on uh, Fed Jerome Powell, um, I think that's what they've done for ages. And I don't care if it's been a Republican or a Democrat. And I know that, you know, I was watching the the Tucker uh, with uh, uh, Trump yesterday on X, where you know he's saying, "Well, these these pri these inflation numbers were much lower under me." But and I'm and I'm no Biden fan. I want to make that very clear. But a lot of that money printing caused the inflation, and so they they've had to use the tools that they had accessible to them, which you know in a fiat currency system where they can just print unlimited amounts of money. Uh, this is the tool that they use. They're either going to print money or they're going to suck the air out of the room. And and they're doing that. And I think, you know, in my opinion, and again, I'm no fan of the Biden administration, but I think Jerome Powell has been doing the best that he can do with his available tools. What would somebody do differently? I don't know. I think I think honestly, Jerome Powell's really just taken a, a a page out of uh Reaganomics and they're doing exactly what they did back in the uh early eighties. And you know, in my opinion, and you and I have talked about this outside of the studio, Armstrong, I wouldn't rule the United States out. And I'm I'm a pretty hardcore crypto guy, but you know, these these guys do know what they're doing. They they do know, they understand their fiat currency, but there is a lot of different things this time. But uh, let's see. I mean, so far, nothing has really broken so badly uh, to where it's it's caused a lot of grief, a lot of unemployment. But it may happen. Who knows? But I, I think right now the, the 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 optimistic thing is nothing has really broken too bad. And inflation, for the most part, has started to come down over the last seven, eight months. So I guess we're, we're going to have to see what happens. <laughs> you know, there is one thing when you speak to voters that they all will agree, which is of great concern to them, and it's the growing cost of living. 
And I think what sometimes is missed in that, the impact that it also has on businesses. Some businesses to the point where they've had to shut down. So Evan, when you think about um, the growing cost of living, whether it's gas, food, just, just the basics to survive, how does one adjust, especially if they're not salary increases, they don't have that little extra that's coming in, they depend on one income, and yet prices continue to soar, but that salary remains the same. What needs to change for both the consumer and the marketplace? I mean, you essentially... No, 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 Evan. Evan? Oh, sorry. sorry, Evan. <laughs> um, well, I mean, in the immediate, um, right now, in the immediate, the, um, the consumer obviously have to make some, some tough decisions from, a, from an expense standpoint and prioritize um, their expenses if salaries are not increasing and, and cost of goods are continuing to go up or so. So that's something that, that, that needs to happen on the consumer side. But obviously, from a, um, on, the, uh, on the business side, um, you know, entrepreneurship as far as creative ways to continue to spur new um, economic growth through businesses and things of that nature to drive and, and contribute to the GDP. But um, as an entrepreneur, um, I'm feeling that the pain of, of increased labor costs and increased cost of goods. Um, the inflation also works to our benefit in some degree as well, too, from a standpoint of higher rates in the hospitality industry that we can charge um, that hopefully can transcend to um, wages and people being able to afford um, you know, the, the, the higher cost of living today. But right now, it is, a, uh, it is an issue. David, how should people read the volatile stock market? I mean, again, what, why is there volatility in the stock market? It's because the Fed essentially keeps playing the interest rate like, uh, like your favorite CD. And, and what they did is they sucked all of the air out of the room um, Actually, let, let, let's put it this way. Think of it, you're going, you know, 80 miles an hour down the highway, and all of a sudden a, a brick wall pops up. That's essentially what happened. The, the 80 miles per hour was the 40% of the entire cash supply that we printed during 2020 and 2021. Uh, both, again, Trump and Biden uh, printed massive amounts of money lowering interest rates down to 0.01% and then increasing the interest rates to where it stands right now. I think the, the federal rate is at 5.5%. That's a 5,500% roughly increase in interest rates. And so what's that going to do to, to high risk assets? Well, people are going to think much differently about investing in the stock market. And we're seeing that today. Uh, in the stock market right now, Nvidia had smashed. They smashed their uh, the, all the numbers that they were projecting, and uh, and still the stock market is down. And their their stock is only up like one point some percent, which is great for a company like theirs. But in any you know in a in a more healthy environment where there's more liquidity, you probably would have seen Nvidia go up by five to ten percent. And so right now people are on edge because what happens if the Fed raises interest rates again. Well, that affects everything in terms of speculative investing, such as real estate, the stock market, all that stuff. So you got to really, you got to really be paying attention to what the Fed is doing. And a lot of people got caught off guard because we haven't seen this for 40 years, right? It's like I was stating before, it's since the Reagan administration. And so if the Fed keeps hiking, most likely the stock market is not going to uh, keep going up, or it's going to keep yo-yoing up and down, and it's going to really play with your uh, with your emotions, in my opinion. Evan, let's address healthcare costs and insurance companies when people invest so much in their insurance policy, and then when they finally need their insurance policy to pay for them, uh, the insurer will tell them, "Well, you don't qualify. Uh, we don't necessarily." 
cover that. What do we do about these looming health care costs in this country, which is having a devastating impact on everyday people's lives? Um, well, I don't want to kind of insert sort of political views or so, um, but I sort of believe in some of the other countries, like Canada, um, and their insurance system or so, where it should be available to all citizens. Um, but, you know, being so our insurance sector um, is in the private sector or so, and there's a lot of different elements that creates the cost of insurance to go up and the, and the coverage to go down. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's a very serious issue. Um, don't know if I have the exact answer to how to solve for it or so, but it's something that has just grown over time from a standpoint of cost and um, deductibles are a lot higher today. And, 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 and as you said, coverages are, are less. So I just think that um, government and, and, and private sector just need to really come together both sides of the aisle just really need to focus on how to bring, um, you know, a, an adequate solution uh, to this issue. Let me let me stay with you. Um, you know, we all have read the reports where the younger generation don't feel they want to own homes; they want to rent because they don't have the responsibility. I just think that somebody's giving them this guided information because they're going to still pass along all their expenses to you. They're going to get the tax write off and you're going to play, probably pay more in rent per month than you probably pay at a mortgage. I, I just think there's a, there's a lot of financial illiteracy in this country that is not addressed and young people just don't get the right information because one of the first lessons my father ever taught me as a kid, he said, boy, they're not making any more land. Own yourself a piece of America. And the best way to own a piece of America is home ownership. And once you get that home ownership, get yourself an investment property. He said, by the time you're in your 30s and 40s, boy, you're going to be doing pretty good. We're going to discuss that on the other side of this break when we come back. I'm Armstrong Williams. About. So, Evan, let's tackle the housing market and is there a housing crash looming? And also, talk to this younger generation, renting versus owning. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of friends that are a little closer to age with me that came through the great financial crisis had this mentality as well, the millennials. I know we're on Gen Z today. And their thought pattern was what happened during the great financial crisis caused them to want to rent instead of own. Um, but just as you said, um, Armstrong, that it's just been a misinformation from a financial literacy standpoint. Um, there's nothing like um, owning real estate compared to, to renting. All you're doing is, is, is helping someone else um, live their dreams and creating residual income for someone else. But from a standpoint of, of owning, you get the benefit, obviously, of the appreciation. Um, you get the, uh, the deductions from interest that you pay. Um, and I mean, that's how you, you build wealth. If you look at the number one source of, of wealth in this country for people is in their, is in their homes or so. So not taking advantage of, of, of that opportunity, particularly when the rates were almost at zero over the last eight, nine years or so, was just a great time. I mean, when I first bought my home um, in my mid 20s or so, 8% was, was the interest rate or so. I'm sort of dating myself, but um, but it's just, it, I cannot imagine how anybody can, can provide guidance to, 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 to rent versus, versus home ownership. I mean, that is the number one way to create wealth in this country. Javier, I know you want to comment on this topic. So go ahead. Yeah. So see, I, I kind of share a, a different opinion. Um, I think that it is about uh, educating people. Uh, but at the same time, you got to realize this, Wall Street is on a tear buying real estate right now why well because they're able to go and buy some of these single family homes or apartments and they're able to rent them out for an roi of anywhere between seven and fifteen percent a year now if i'm if i'm a betting man i'd rather do that than invest it in a 10-year t-bill that i'm going to be tying my my uh money up and not have any increase in the asset that i'm that i'm buying aka the dollar and so 
when you see that Wall Street and their CNBC is projecting that by 2030, 40%, 40% of all single family homes and all apartments are going to be owned by corporations, hedge funds, and institutions. And so this is really pricing out a lot of people from buying that. And that's why this is one of the main reasons that even though interest rates have gone up, that the supply has remained super duper low because Wall Street's just going in and raking this stuff up. In Texas last year alone, they bought 30% of all of the single family homes. And so that's no that's no number to, to turn a blind eye to. So what I would say is this, there are a lot of projects that are, that are popping up in the crypto world and in the TradFi world where you're able to either fractionalize or tokenize, AKA fraction, on the blockchain real estate and i think this is going to be the way that the gen xers and the millennials are probably going to be buying up real estate in the form of an investment here soon because it is going to be way too expensive to buy real estate in the next few years and especially with wages not catching up with inflation uh i i see it's it's not quite as simple as just educating people i think that people need to wages are we're going to really have to come up otherwise uh, in my opinion, again, fractional, fractionalization and tokenization is really going to be the way to go if they want to get their piece of real estate in the U.S. or any other country. You know, but Evan, listen, when my generation was buying real estate in Washington, D.C., in the 80s, interest rates were 13 percent, 13 percent. So it, it, every decade has its challenges when it comes to this. But is there a reason to tell kids you're not going to be able to afford it? Uh, is that the answer? Um, so let me just give you a, a case in point to your point. Um, my mom purchased her home in, in Petworth in D.C. for 50000 in 1980. Her interest rate was 14%. She didn't know any better. In 2004, I refinanced, and I realized that she was paying 14% for, what's that, you know, over 20 years. Oh, wow. Right? Um, but fortunately, today, her home is worth you know, close to $900,000. So all of that appreciation that she gained, and, you know, we didn't know that Petworth would be a, 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 a neighborhood that would be gentrified 20-something years ago. But, but look at that story. You know, at the end of the day, you know, my mom is, is retired, and she owns her home free and clear, and, you know, she's yes, practically a millionaire. Out. Yeah, but wait a minute. You also said something very important. You were able, because you were educated, not saying your mother's not, you were able to look at her mortgage and realize we can refinance this. Absolutely. We can do better. Absolutely. So even still, that's a moment, the financial literacy that people need to educate themselves. Let me, Javan, what is the difference between cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs? Well, all cryptocurrencies are programmable money. So... CBDCs are programmable money that the government is basically pumping out. And I think that there's just this big fallacy that the government's saying, well, you don't want to be in cryptocurrencies. You want to be in our country backed or central bank digital currency because, you know, you can trust us. But the problem is, again, if they have the ability to just keep printing money and sucking money out of the equation, uh, there's there's a there's a massive issue with that, and so cryptocurrencies though the actual cryptocurrencies the ones that originally came out such as Bitcoin Ethereum are decentralized currencies, and this means that there is no government intervention. They cannot come and stop the Bitcoin network from working as long as there are Bitcoin miners or nodes along the world. They cannot stop the Ethereum network as long as there are Ethereum nodes around the world processing transactions. Where with CBDCs, they can control that. But, but, then, say, but, how, but how do these CBDCs differ from the traditional fiat currencies? They don't. The only thing is that the processing time is much faster. And that's, again, the fallacy that the government's coming out and saying, well, you know, this is great. This is, this is, uh, they, they basically put lipstick on a pig. And the problem is, is they're, they're going to be able to do the exact same things, which for me, what I'm looking for is, all right, what is that currency backed by? You know, we got rid of that in 1972 with with uh, Nixon going off the gold standard, but there's no, it's not backed by anything. Even though I will say this, the U.S. does still have the largest 
reserve of gold by a long shot. I mean, they've got the most amount of gold, but it's still not backed. We cannot redeem it for something. And as long as they can just keep printing, and especially now with BRICS coming out with, you know, these, I think, four or five new nations, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and a few other uh, that are going towards them, I really see the petrodollar losing its value over the coming years. So uh, I, I'm definitely not a fan of CBDCs. I think it's just a, a, a new iteration of fiat currencies, and I don't think it's going to help anybody. You know, um, Evan, for the last year, or maybe the last two years, the big R word has sort of petrified people. Some say we are in it, some say we're not, some say we're going in it. Do you believe that a recession is looming? Um, I guess we've been uh, asking ourselves that question for all of 2023, and we've been predicting that, that it, was, it has been looming. Happy to see um, inflation starting to settle. And as an entrepreneur, we are just opti optimistic by nature. So in, in deals that we're looking at, you know, we're, we're sort of anticipating that rates are going to stay flat and hopefully eventually come down. Um, so I think we've just been on a brink of, 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 of a recession. And, you know, what do I think personally as far as is it looming? It does feel that way. Um, so but again, you know, we're just hopeful that cost kind of just comes in line, labor comes in line, inflation, and, um, and we'll be able to go back to normal from a standpoint of doing business. Are, are you concerned about our national debt? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the economy just in, in, in general, just from, from where we are. I mean, what, what happened during um, COVID when the trillions of dollars were printed um, you, you know, yes, that was a, a Band-Aid, and yes, that, that helped at that moment, but the aftermath of it is what we're experiencing today with, the, with, with inflation. And now, you know, you know the, the significant increase in, in interest rates, which is, in my world, has um, curtailed transactions significantly. If you speak to all of the brokers, um, no one's buying. No one's buying hotels today. You know, transactions are just significantly down because Sellers still have expectations of pre-COVID pricing, and interest rates are a lot higher. Cost of capital is a lot higher. Even if you look at the private equity market, some of them can now invest in debt and, and, and get a better return in investing in equity. So it's just, it's just creating just a standstill, and, and transactions are not happening. And obviously, that's, that's going in, in the wrong direction from a standpoint of GDP growth. Jimmy, would you like to add to that? No, I mean, I, I actually would agree with uh, with Evan on that. You know, I I think what you know, what's the definition of uh, of a recession? Two quarters of uh, of declining economy, right? And so, or declining GDP. And I, you know, I'm hoping that the interest rates do stay flat and and start to go down. But then, you know, again, inflation kind of is going to rear its ugly head again. And I think, you know, a lot you of people know, don't you, realize. You, you, I, know, I know we're talking about U.S. this inflation, but what needs to happen with the U.S. banking system if you could make recommendations? Wow. I mean, the, the U.S. banking system, in my opinion, needs to become a little bit more decentralized like it used to be uh, before. I think what happens when you standardize things uh, throughout the whole country it, it's it's a little tough because each region has you know a different situation um you know there there definitely should probably be a cap on on the amount of time that these banks can put uh their that freeze the money up so like the big thing with you know first republic and svb bank was that they went in and they put the majority of their in their uh, bankers money in the 10 year T bill at, you know, to get an extra point, you know, zero one percent, which was great because they had billions of dollars. But the problem was they locked up all that money for 10 years mm -hmm. and they ended up having a major bank run. And so they ended up having to sell those bonds at like a 50 percent loss. 
Um, and so that's that's that was the major issue with those banks. And we've got 700 and some banks in the same predicament right now. So I think there has to be a law or some regulation that comes out that says, hey, look, these guys definitely need to keep their money more liquid and they cannot just keep, you know, trying to go for these long term investments, locking up money, because if somebody wants their money, they need it. And we need let to make me, sure let that me, the let, me, let me interject this before I say goodbye, because I'm I want to give Evan the last word, but it includes both of you. Is it true that the rich will continue to get richer and the poor will become poor um, no matter who's in the White House, no matter what the banking system is? And if you had any advice, Evan, for those who see themselves that Don would, no matter what happens with the economy, they're going to be impacted by it, and you guys just seem to keep moving along. What advice would you have for those that on the bottom rung of the ladder want to get to a higher rung of the ladder? Because I believe in capitalism. It cannot exist as, as people on the bottom rung of that ladder find themselves at the top rung of that ladder eventually. Um, I mean, what I would advise first and foremost is, um, is education. And if you think about it, you know, 1% of the population controls, you know, 99% of, 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 of the finances here. And um, educate yourself by uh, investing in learning from, from these one percenters or so in, in books, in podcasts. And you have to change the way you think because the, the status quo and the way everyone else thinks is the same from a standpoint of just um, being an employee, living check to check, and things of that nature. And, and the real answer to creating wealth is when you can have money work for you and you don't have to exchange time for money. So educating yourself on how could you implement and learn how to create residual income in your life. And, and obviously that, 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 that takes some, some element of risk, um, some element of creativity, but education is where it starts. And one thing that you can't teach is ambition and hard work and someone that just creates good habits where you're just gonna remain consistent and you're gonna just pursue um, what it is that you're trying to do. And that's not normal. You have to be abnormal. You have to be unlike everyone else and you have to think unlike everyone else if you wanna be unlike everyone else. I like that. I wanna thank Given and Evan both for joining us. Did you know the IRS is going paperless and how that will impact you? That's up next on this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. And welcome back to the broadcast. Neil Sharma, uh, 27th Century Technologies, and Ritesh Power is the, C uh, yes, the Chief Technology Officer at 22nd Century Technologies. Join us, not to talk about the fact that they're software engineers, but the fact that the IRS is going paperless. Uh, talk about what it means, because sometimes, you know, uh, I get emails saying, would you want your statement sent paperless? Or do you want it sent regular mail? Now, some people will say, send it to me, paperless, because I don't deal with all that paper. I like to read everything. So I don't want no paperless system. But tell us how that impacts the, our, the, the taxpayer and the tax system going forward. So uh, we are here to talk about IDP bot, but when IRS says paperless, they are really not talking about removing the paper. It's just about making it their own systems deal with the paperless system. They can still have papers coming from the taxpayer, so they are not reducing or eliminating the papers from that angle. All they are talking about is having the paper converted into the digital so they can process faster, communicate faster with the taxpayers, remove all the inefficiencies of dealing with the paper. That, that's what it's all about. Explain inefficiencies of dealing with the paper. So, so if, if you send a tax return today, right, and you handwrite on it, it takes a lot of time for IRS to process that. So our system, the IDP bot, is a fast, accurate, more reliable system which can extract the information using machine learning in a much faster way so people can more efficiently process the return rather than typing in, in an ancient way of dealing with the data. So that, that's what it is all about. So, 
Yeah, it's it's primarily people that doesn't mean that we are eliminating, IRS is eliminating. It's it's giving an option to taxpayer. That's the future. We the whole industry environment want to go green. So paperless is helping giving an option to the taxpayer that IRS will have option for them to file their paper uh, uh, returns even paperless like and the solutions which we developed uh, IDP boat is right now converting all the papers IRS has into its uh, digitalization uh, yeah, but, but the only thing the consumer mm -hmm. would be concerned about is this first off most people don't trust the IRS um, does this place the consumer at a disadvantage? Or is there something more sinister going on here that is not going to empower the consumer but give more power to the IRS uh, to go after people? No, I, I, so definitely there is no change in the business. Mm -hmm. All you can think of this, if you had sent a paper and you were looking for a refund from IRS, right, for example, it might have taken three to four weeks how your document is processed, right? This way, they can process document much more faster. So people can get paid sooner? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. The, I mean, it's, the efficiency is all about everywhere. It's not just about refunds or you owing the money or they processing. It's about making the system much more faster. That, that's about more it. Efficient. More, more efficient. More efficient, more faster, more and, accurate. And like the data, uh, the IRS recent data says that when a normal person on the call, when they reach out to IRS is over 30 minutes. And when they get on the call, they don't get answer because the person on the other side does not have that data on the system. So what this is going to make it, even if they get in the paper, it will be much faster system available on the online because if, if I'm a taxpayer and I call IRS for a question, if they don't have my data in the system, it's lying somewhere on the paper, they cannot answer it. What this system or what IRS is going using our system is providing them flexibility that the the moment they get it, it reaches there and it automatically the whole so, data so, is available. So this will secure, ensure the security of the taxpayer information in a paperless system? A absolutely. It's, it's as secure as anything stored in IRS today. It's a it's, it's stored in the uh, uh, government secure data, it's a FedRAMP uh, certified, which is the highest level of the cyber security. So it's, it's everything, there's nothing changed from the cyber security. In fact, every day it's get more secure. And, and I want to add that it's not changing the way they are doing the business today. So the data is still there, it just takes more time right now to reach there. This way it's reaching much faster. So the, the question I can hear someone mm -hmm. in their mind saying, so this is why they're justified 80,000 more IRS agents? So this system has nothing to do with yeah. that, I number just wanna, one. I just want to get yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, answer. So, yeah. so th this system has nothing to do with hiring more agents or doing that. Even uh, what we heard from Treasury saying that they are still going to keep the same level of audits and everything. So this is nothing to do with that. It's more, so during the COVID, if you know, the paper filing was sitting in the aisles of IRS offices because they can't process, people are not in the office, right? So all those things boils down to how can we make the system more efficient? How can we get the data into the system for making decisions? How can we do more efficient workflows with the data for data analytics, things like that? But nothing to do with hiring more agents or doing more audits. It's not about that. But could this efficiency mean less audits or more audits on the taxpayer? I, as Atish mentioned, the system we are providing is to increase the efficiencies, to increase giving them the data. It has this initiative from IRS has no direct relationship with the <coughs> audits or getting more budget for those 80,000 auditors you said. Uh, that's this, this particular solution and uh, initiative has no direct relationship with that. So here's what I'm hearing though. Mm -hmm. This is the, your system that you are delivering to the IRS. Yes. Your company will be operating this system. So our system is actually... You created it. Yes. yes. Our, you, created, you created the software. So yep. our system, we, we are not envisioning just for IRS. It's, it's a paper conversion into mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. thing. Like we, you were talking like about 
digitalization of currency and all mm -hmm. that, right? So it's all about digitalization. But at the same time, this can be applied to Social Security Administration, Veteran Affairs, USDA for the farm loan programs. So think of this, that people, paper still has to exist in the market for many, many decades. People are going to still love to hold their paper, send the paper, receive the paper, right? This is more about creating the system data from the paper without much of human intervention, extracting the information, making better decision, making more open communication with the taxpayers or the citizens or you know even for the banking insurance dmv you walk in you still have to fill in the paper and then somebody has to wait for 15 minutes until somebody's data is filled in and then they provide the service so we we are looking from that angle so there is no doubt you're encouraging the american american taxpayer to embrace this paperless system absolutely and this is this is bringing in innovation, e using the innovation and efficiency for the American taxpayers. I mean, as I said, the data available g after converting to digitalize, they can get access to any questions much, much faster. They can get the support from IRS much faster. That's what it's, it is providing that. It's a it's an innovation, that's what we are. Your earlier question about is that system doing? So this is one of those innovation uh, the companies of our size, small and mid size, providing to IRS. Like this whole thing from uh, came from inception to it was done in eight months. So oh, wow. so the very fast the they call it IRS pilot in uh, procurement from their acquisition to go live it was eight months and tenth month. Secretary Janet Allen was in our office announcing uh, this big initiative. So think about it, what uh, the innovation uh, can bring it to the government where uh, in some of the cases federal government spent billions of dollars to get such systems and by putting these kind of innovations, as I said, in seven months we were live and uh, tenth month this whole initiative was uh, announced. To well, the tell us more about your 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 company overall. Yeah. Yeah. So so I'll let <coughs> yeah. Mr. Nishim, so, as the CEO, so, talk about it. Yeah. So uh, thanks. Twenty second century, we are a, a mid sized uh, government focused IT integrators, bringing the innovation uh, to the government agencies, federal, DoD, and state and local. Like solutions like uh, the what we develop for IRS. That's what we are producing for the digital transformation, for cloud transformation, IT infrastructure, that's what we have been doing it. And uh, so we, we were uh, a service company, IT services company, uh, for last uh, uh, 15 years. And so last two years, we start building the product. So the services were people and process, which was helping the customers. For last two years, we start putting this innovation through our products in the middle to develop these products and providing product enabled services to our customer improving their efficiency reducing their cost that's what we have been doing you know this is you know the credit card companies yeah. are doing something very simpler similar they're going paperless um were you involved in that process we we are not but i think there is a a symmetry so so think of this, yeah. innovation is popping up every day, right? So newer technologies are available, and they're going to get engraved into the day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. of all kind of processes. So everybody now, because the technology is available, machine learning is available, mm -hmm. everybody's trying to make much more efficient systems. And people who embrace, they see efficiency, cost reduction, better communication with their customers, m much more satisfaction uh, with their customers, and credit card companies to all the federal, state, local agencies are looking into this right you know, now. What I like to do when we come back, when we talk about technology mm -hmm. and innovation, sometimes, no matter how efficient it may become, it comes at the cost of someone's job. And I, I want to talk about that when we come back. I want to talk yeah. about how will it improve affect the workforce. Now, some people would say that the IRS needs to reduce its workforce, but it's still somebody's employment. I'm Armstrong Williams. We'll be back.
Oh, Tito. You know, Anil came to this country with $100 in his pocket. It's really the true story of the immigrant song. And, he, and they built this amazing country, company. Um, and obviously, efficiency is so important. But as we were going out the break, we were talking about at the expense of whom. And then I also want to get into where is this technology? Where is AI going? You're with the IRS today. What's the future for you tomorrow? All right, so first of all, where we started off with the, at the expense of somebody's job, right? I think if you look back for many, many decades or even centuries, whenever the newer technology came, it brought a lot more jobs than it destroyed before it. So. New threats are popping up every way. If you look at that, healthcare, if you look at cybersecurity, if you look at defense, if you look at even manual paper processing to everything, machine learning or any newer technologies help augment making decisions faster. It's ultimately it comes down to that information we have and the decision we are making and the people equipped with that technology. It always creates more job. In my mind, I think space, opening up of the space and things like that will create a lot more jobs. People will slowly, slowly get aligned with more technology, like nobody can live without their phone anymore. So it's, it's like that. It's going to be newer technologies adding into more jobs. It's never it, going it to reduce the it job. It doesn't frighten you on any level? No, actually. You're dealing with mankind. So that's who, why. Who can exploit? So think destroy. of this. Just think about, I mean, you know, when I fly sometimes, uh -huh. I think about, God, just think how constructive man is when you think about these yeah. big jets. And then you look down and you say, oh my God, but they're equally destructive. And, and because of that reason alone, I think we need to invest into a lot more safer technologies. So think of this, kids when they are at home, parents take care of them, eventually they go to college, become independent, right? I think the time has come for mankind to have safer technologies and leave the mother earth and then go to newer places and advance new things. I think the frightening is true, but at the same time, we need to make safe harbor, more habitable areas, so that we are not living in danger all the time. And I think only technology can help there, nothing else. So, Neil, you came here with $100. Just tell us a little about the story. I just can't <laughs> say it and not have you give some more texture to it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's a, it's a one good story of an uh, American dream. That's what... Uh, originally from where? Originally from India. Mm -hmm. Came uh, to this country in 97. Y2K, technocrat, as I said, uh, from the profession. Y2K, solving the technology problem. We always are on that ahead uh, through innovation and other way. And, uh, and when you came as an immigrant coming uh, here with the American dream, you have, you have that drive. Uh, that I, I still have that drive and that passion for the uh, failure is not an option. Uh, and uh, all we want to do is work hard. And you, th you know, the thing about America, and, and you certainly can speak to this, could you have built this so quickly any other place than America? <laughs> that, that's the beauty of uh, uh, this nation. It provides you the opportunities. The opportunities you have here in America are it, it cannot be compared anywhere. Of course, uh, in in our times when I came here, the overall, the opportunities, the support system, the transparencies, that all combination is what make us successful. That's what we were able to build from, from zero, as you said, $100 in the pocket today. We are $450 million in size as a company. So do, do you think that this kind of technology where it makes... Um, the IRS more efficient. What about healthcare? Absolutely. Uh, this kind mm -hmm. of technology is healthcare is a big use case, and healthcare still use those paper. Think very basic example of healthcare. You go to a doctor, you sit there, fill the form, give it to the, and they are still doing that manual. That's I'm giving a very raw example of one of the use case which we 
our system will solve. That it's a rather than having that system of the manual paper and then a receptionist talking or, or feeding the it on the system, take time and while you're waiting there just to get a uh, turn of the doctor. So that's, that's one simple example. But other than that, veteran affairs, Department of Health, they have billions of papers which need to be uh, provide the digitalization to get you the real easy access of your health records and right now. Yeah, and I want to add more on that. See, right now what the paper processing does right now, when you go and fill a paper at healthcare or any other provider, right, sometimes they don't take all that information and feed into the system. They only take vital information to run the day-to-day -day processes. Some, some of that information doesn't get into their system. Now, how does that impact a patient or healthcare provider both, they are not having all full 360 picture of a human to make proper decision. You you checked on something that you are allergic, let's say if did, that did not get into their system and they give you some medicine which you are not supposed to take, those kind of mistakes can be avoided by using our system or systems like ours where you, know, you not only can do fast, accurate data processing, but also make better decisions for patients, for citizens, for everybody. So, uh, making the IRS more efficient uh, is only going to benefit the taxpayer. Yep, absolutely. That's yep. And that is one of the biggest headaches when you think about bureaucracies like the IRS. Because listen, when you're not efficient, whether it's health care, whether it's the legal, you're going to make mistakes. And those mistakes are at the expense yep. of everyday people. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's what this IDP board is providing. It's an innovation we have created just to improve the efficiency of the government. What does it take um, in, in the laboratory to work out all the imperfections? I mean, when you mentioned this iconic, and I, I saw this iconic picture in my mind of you and the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen standing together making an announcement. I mean, that is the, the standard of credibility when the Secretary of Treasury, because you know, they vet companies all around before they make a decision of whom they're gonna give that contract to. Talk, talk about yeah, what it, it takes to bring this kind of product sure. to the marketplace where, and I know you've gone through the bureaucracy, yeah. I don't even want you to tell me <laughs> the painstaking process yeah, of getting yeah. it to the point where yeah. you've become the contractor yeah. for the yeah. U.S. Absolutely. Treasury Department. Ab absolutely. As I said, this is one of those innovation created from from start to end, not the end, but develop it within eight months. So it, it was a it started Remarkable. with a a innovative acquisition and give credit to the uh, new IRS uh, this DG team they call it and uh, they they build this acquisition bring us as a one of the vendor, they picked up multiple of those, that was the, the model of acquisition. And the, our team in the innovation lab, and uh, Ritesh uh, lead this, that team, they worked day and night to first understand the problem, what it is, and to make sure we built a solution not, there were very many easy solutions available for what they wanted to do it. But we wanted to add that value, add that efficiency, put some machine learning component which is innovative. And and that process, of course I will have Ritesh talk more on because he was leading the technology team, but they were working to make sure, understand the problem. One thing, this process as you said, testing and all, it was a iterative process working with IRS DG team as a partner. We were developing it, sending it to them, they're giving us feedback. Within 24 hours, we're coming the new release, developing it, and this you want to... Yeah. 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 So, uh, as you said, uh, I really want to thank Mr. Harrison Smith and his team for creating this innovative vehicle for us to... Eight months. Yes. Eight That's months. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you that when we met with them, uh, and all the business team we saw, we really saw the challenge in hand. We could see that how, body, how somebody could like take a paper which has like sometimes coffee stains, crumpled, I mean, you, you can name anything when they receive the paper. 
and taking that but, into but a what digital. You, what you're saying here, mm -hmm. uh, more important than mm -hmm. anything else, that should give us some comfort, is that agencies like the IRS wants to become more efficient yep. to so. serve the American, American people yep. in a very efficient and effective way. Uh, and that's why I cannot thank you both for joining us today, uh, because I, I'm sure when you talk about taxpayers and IRS, there's a negative connotation. But yeah. today, this is a good news story. Yep, yep, yep. And thank you for sharing that good news with us.